Our job is to trust God, do good, stay peaceful, and trust that God is fighting for us, and he's dealing with our enemies. The next thing, number three, way to keep, to resist the devil, and this is so cool, is just spending time in the presence of God. <laughs> Actual, your quiet time with God is spiritual warfare. Peace is spiritual warfare. What we put our time and money into is what's important to us. If you say that you don't have time to spend with God, then the truth is it's just not important to you. If I have a friend and they never have time to call me, then bottom line is, is I'm not important to them. Right. We put our time and money into what is important to us. If growing as a Christian is important to you, you will put money into Christian resources that will educate you. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's always people talking about us somewhere, and it's not always nice stuff. And the more people you're in front of, the more people that are likely to talk about you. Like if you're just a regular employee, you might not get as much, you become the boss, and then more people are gonna have something to say. Well, you ought to try something like what I'm doing. That's a whole lot of fun. So I love this scripture in Psalm 3120. Actually, somebody in ministry called me the other day and they were going through something and knew that a certain amount of people didn't like what they were doing, but they felt like they were being led by God. And I shared this scripture with them right away. Psalm 3120. In the secret place of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You keep them secretly in your pavilion from the strife of tongues. So that means no matter who's talking about me in an unkind way or what their opinions are about me, as I spend my time with God every day and just sit in his presence and talk to him, and read a little word or whatever I decide to do during that time, thank God, pray for other people. It's just my quiet time, my time with God. And see, I'm aware that God is an ever-present reality. And you know, if, um, let's say, okay, I've, I've got perfume on today. It's a little bit of a strong smell, smells a little bit like cinnamon. I wear it because it's the only one I can smell on me. And, uh, <laughs> but you know something, now, if you hung out with me this afternoon and maybe gave me a hug or something, you'd, you'd probably get that on you, and you'd smell like it. Well, guess what? When we hang out with Jesus, we get him on us too. <laughs> Amen? And, uh, uh, I remember one time I'd, I'd spent, I was going to do like one of the first speaking engagements I ever had, and it was, it was one of the first large ones, and I was petrified, just petrified. I was actually in Jacksonville, Florida, and I, sp <laughs> I spent so much time with God that morning, I was so scared. Let me tell you something, the more scared you are, the more you'll lean on God. And uh, I'll never forget this, when I, when I walked into the arena that morning, Dave had already gotten there, and he was over at our resource table, and I was walking down the hallway by myself, and a lady came up to me, and she said, I can tell that you've been with God. Well, that just meant so much to me. And you know what? Let me tell you something. When you've been with God, people know that there's something about you. They may not know enough to know that you've been with God, but they, it's like you're peaceful, you're pleasant. You know what? I don't have to ask people really anymore, are you a Christian or not? All you got to do is be around somebody for just a little bit of time. And you, it, it's not very long, and you can say, you're a believer, aren't you? <laughs> At least that's the way it ought to be. I mean, if you have to check my car to see if I've got a Christian bumper sticker to find out if I'm a believer or not, then I got a problem. You should be able to tell by the way I act when you accidentally cut me off in traffic. <laughs> Come on now, I'm preaching good. Man, I wouldn't go out of my house without spending time with God. I'd be petrified to do that. The devil hates me and I know it. And I've got defense against him, but one of the best ones is just to be smeared all over with God. Just get that, <laughs> that bottle. 
Matter of fact, I layered it up this morning. I put the lotion in, then I put the perfume on because they told me, so I, you know, I'm, we just need to layer ourselves in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost every morning, amen? And sad to say, there are people, you love God and you go to church all the time and you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, about just spending time with, spending, you know. You maybe have your little list of things that you do. You pray your pre-prescribed prayers and read your one chapter a day whether you need to or not. I'm talking about hanging with the king. I'm talking about getting with your friend and talking to him about everything that concerns you. I'm talking about being real. All right, now, number four, resist the devil with words. Know the Word of God. Words are powerful. Proverbs 18, 21, the power of life and death is in the tongue. God teaches me a lot about words. I have spent a lot of time studying words. And it's not even always who you're talking to that is the important thing, it's the words that you speak. So you can speak things out into the atmosphere and they still affect your life. If you've got a spirit of strife in your home, you can rebuke that spirit of strife and declare, I'm not gonna live in the midst of strife. I take authority over it in Jesus' name. Now that doesn't mean that you want to make some changes in your home, but it does mean that you're dealing with this, the, the spiritual oppression that's trying to rule the atmosphere in your home. During worship this morning, I honestly, and I'm just trying to be spooky, I mean, I felt a real freedom. I just, I felt a real freedom in here this morning. And I believe that praise and worship breaks through the darkness and ushers that in. You know, the people that we have for praise and worship are very important to me. I'm in all the praise and worship from the moment it starts because it is important to me. It helps prepare me. It helps prepare you. We don't bring somebody to just sing a nice song. I want somebody that can get into worship, that can get the people's minds off of themselves and onto God. Know the Word of God and speak the Word. The Bible says that we can speak a word to the weary in due season. Isn't it amazing that you can change somebody's whole day with a right word <laughs> at the right time? Think about that. Or you can ruin somebody's day with a wrong word at the wrong time. Isaiah 53, 7. This shows the power of words better than anything, I think. He was oppressed, talking about Jesus, but yet when he was afflicted, he was submissive and he opened not his mouth. <laughs> like a lamb led to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Now, you know what? I, I didn't understand that. I mean, all the years I spent in church, we, we studied out of Isaiah 53. I didn't understand that. He didn't open his mouth. I mean, I didn't even pay attention. He didn't open his mouth. But I understand that now. Let's look at John 14, 30. This is where we closed last night, but I'd like to just spend a few more minutes with this. You're going to see something powerful. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Now, Jesus... When he was getting ready to go into his greatest time of suffering, he said to his disciples, <laughs> verse 30, I will not talk with you much more, for the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of this world is coming, and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in me, nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. And, and he might as well have said, and I'm going to be under great pressure. This is going to be a time of great pain and affliction for me, and I'm not going to talk much because I'm not going to take a chance on saying something out of pain or frustration and opening a door for the enemy. Like a lamb being led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. And I'll tell you, one day last week, I was having kind of a rough day, and I just, the devil was inviting me to a pity party and I came close to going. I, actually, I think I did go for a little while. And uh, you, you know, when you're like that, you, 
for some reason, there's something in us that wants somebody to say, is everything okay? So then we can tell them how not okay everything is. <laughs> Come on, are you with me? And of course, it's all foolishness. It's just flesh and emotion and stuff like that. And, and I already, I just made my mind up. If anybody notices that I'm having a little bit of a rough time and they ask me what's going on, I'm going to say nothing that I say would be good, so I've decided to say nothing. <laughs> and I think we need to apply that in our lives. Sometimes when you know that you're in such a place that nothing you say is going to be worth hearing or that you may open a door for the enemy or, or you're going to be saying something you're going to be sorry for later, then just say, God, if nothing else, help me keep my mouth shut. You know what we tell our kids? If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Okay, so I'm going to pretend to be mama today. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And I talk to myself too. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> like a sheep led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Now let's talk about the other side of it. There's a time to keep your mouth shut, but there's a time to prophesy. Ezekiel 37, one of the best groups of Scripture that talks about the power of prophesying the Word of God, and that just means to speak it out. Every time the Bible talks about prophesying, it's not talking about the office of a prophet. I'm prophesying the Word today. I'm declaring it and speaking it out boldly under God's anointing, and it's, it's piercing darkness and making a difference in people's lives. Okay, now this is 10 verses, but I want you to keep up with me. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the midst of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. <laughs> and he caused me to pass round about and among the bones, and there were very many bones in the valley, and behold, they were very dry. Now, do you ever feel like that everywhere you look, all you see is dead, dry bones? <laughs> Come on, a mountain of debt, a pile of diapers, a sink full of dirty dishes a car that don't run, a garage that hasn't been cleaned out in a hundred years, a husband that hasn't shaved in two weeks, you know. <laughs> Our wife that hasn't combed her hair in a month, you know. <laughs> and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? When we come into a relationship with Christ, we've all got a valley full of dead bones. And it's almost like we look at it and say, God, can you really do anything with this mess? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. In other words, if it can be fixed, you're the only one has got the answer. And so he said to me, prophesy to these bones. <laughs> and say to them, oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Wow. You can prophesy over your past and say, I am forgetting what lies behind, and I am pressing on to the good things that are ahead. You can prophesy the Word of God over your past, over your future, over your mind, over your emotions, over your children, over your marriage, over everything in your life. Come on, we know how to open our mouth and say stuff. We've just spent a lifetime saying stupid stuff. And now it's time to start spending time every day confessing the Word of God out loud. Your mouth is dangerous to the kingdom of darkness when you get the Word of God coming out of it. In Revelation, Jesus is depicted coming in on a charging white horse with a sword going out of his mouth. The Word of God is sharp and quick and powerful like a two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. This is our greatest weapon against the enemy. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. You can't see a word, but you can feel the effect of a word. Words have creative power. Destructive or creative power. It's up to us what we put in them. A word is a container. You can fill it with whatever you want to. Verse 5, thus says the Lord God to these bones. <laughs> God talked to bones. Behold, I will cause breath and spirit to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sin you upon you, and I will bring flesh upon you, and I will cover you with skin, and I will put breath and spirit in you. And you dry bones, you shall live and you shall know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler who calls forth loyalty and obedient service. I don't know about you, but I, this excites me. So I prophesied as I was commanded. 
And as I prophesied, there was a thundering noise, and behold, a shaking and a trembling and a rattling. And bone came together with its bone. And sometimes when you start prophesying the Word of God over your life, first you get a rattling and a shaking and a trembling. Come on. Sometimes things got to come apart really completely before they can ever be put back together. Sometimes we got a problem we can put up with, but not one bad enough to make us stop everything and do something about it. Oh, -oh. come on. Verse 8, And I looked, and behold, there were sinews upon the bones, and flesh came upon them, and skin covered them over, but there was no breath or spirit in them. And then he said to me, Prophesy <laughs> to the breath and the spirit, son of man, and say to the breath and the spirit, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath and spirit, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Let me just change it a little bit. So I spoke the word of God as he put it in my mouth, and the breath and the spirit came into my life. And I stood upon my feet, and I've had a great life that Jesus promised me, and nothing from my past has affected me anymore. I was a battered, a beaten, and a sexually abused child, abandoned by my mother. Now I am a preacher of the Word of God, preaching the Word of God around the globe in 75 languages. Come on, don't tell me it don't work. It's too late for me. Nobody can tell me the word don't work. This is all I've had, and I've used it, and I'm telling you, the word has power in it, but you got to speak it. That's why I love my Bible. I love the word of God. Number five. James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. The easiest way in the world to resist the devil is just do what God tells you to. Isn't that simple? Okay, well, let's see. How can I preach on that? <laughs> do it. <laughs> Whatever he says to you, do it. Psalm 91, 11. For he will give his angels a special charge over you to accompany and defend and preserve you in all your ways of obedience and service. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't say that I can just walk in known disobedience and get the help and the protection from God that I would if I was obeying him. And I'm not talking about, you know, we all have things in our life that we don't do right. I'm not talking about making mistakes. I'm not talking about getting upset, getting in the flesh, repenting, getting up and going on with God. I make mistakes every single day. I'm talking about known, purposeful disobedience. And there's, well, that's another message, but there's just way, 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 way too much compromise in the body of Christ today. Way too much. I mean, things going on that are just like, you've got to be kidding now, extreme obedience sometimes requires death to self. What that means is if I'm really going to obey God, then I don't always get what I think I want. But if I do obey God, I'll find out later that what I thought I wanted wasn't really what I wanted after all. Did you keep up with that or do I need to do it again? <laughs> Amen. See, I think I want something and I don't want to give it up. And God's saying, no, you need to walk away from this. You need to get away from that. That's poisoning your life. You can't grow in me if you do that. And it's hard for me to give it up. I have to die to self to give it up. I cry when I give it up. I feel like God's mean when I give it up. <laughs> then later I find out that what I thought I wanted wasn't really what I wanted after all. And if I would have got what I wanted, I would have been miserable. And now I'm happy and <laughs> God was right after all. <laughs> Amen. Wow, so many great scriptures about just obeying God. I love Romans 5, 19. Through one man's disobedience, we all became sinners. Talking about Adam. And through one man's obedience, Jesus Christ, the many were made righteous. Wow. Look what happened through Adam, and look what happened through Jesus. Two different choices. One said no to God, one said yes to God. One said yes to the devil, the other said no to the devil. <laughs> the devil is alive and well on the planet. 
He hates God. He hates anything good. He hates us. But he's a defeated foe. He's already been defeated. We just need to know it. Number six, win the war with love. Uh-oh, you overcome evil with good. Let me tell you something. When you've got the biggest problem of your life, that's the greatest time to go be good to somebody else. Now, that went over really good. Okay, we're going to rewind and act like I didn't say that. When you have the greatest problem in your life, the best thing in the world that you can do is go be good to somebody else. <laughs> All right, Matthew 24. This is a serious chapter. <laughs> this is actually about end times, and boy, it lays it out. Be careful, verse 4 says, that no one misleads you, deceiving you and leading you into error. For many will come in and on the strength of my name, appropriating the name which belongs only to me, saying, I'm the Christ, and they'll lead many astray. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be frightened or troubled, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in place after place. Well, but it says, but don't be frightened. Let me tell you something. As children of God, we have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to be afraid of. We don't have to be afraid of Ebola. We don't have to be afraid of terrorists. We don't have to be afraid of uh, financial, economic collapse. We don't have to be afraid of anything. You know why? Because we know where we're going. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go whenever he wants me. I'm going to a better place. Amen. I think we need to hear more about heaven and more about eternity. We need to stop getting our minds so fixed on everything here. And all this is but the beginning and the early pains of the birth pangs of an intolerable anguish. Verse 9, and they will hand you over to suffer affliction and tribulation and put you to death and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, you know, we haven't experienced much of that here, but this is going on in the world. And here it comes, verse 10, and then many will be offended. So in these times that we're living in today, now what happens? Many will be offended. I've never seen a time when people get angry so quick as they do today. Road rage, really? And many will be offended and repelled and will begin to distrust and desert him whom they ought to trust and obey. And they'll stumble and fall away and betray one another and pursue one another with hatred. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive and lead many into error. And here's the verse that I'm after. And the love of the great body of people will grow cold. Because of the wickedness and the lawlessness in the land. The great body of people is the church. And one of the signs of end times is that love among believers will grow cold. And Jesus' word says that we need to be red hot on fire, stirred up in love. The agape of God, I just read it this morning. I was reading a footnote in a different translation of a Bible that I've been reading just for some variety. And it had a footnote about love, agape, which is the God kind of love. And it said... The agape of God has little or nothing to do with emotion and everything to do with will and choice. And so the kind of love we're talking about is not, I don't love you because I feel like it. I love because I'm committed to love. So there's two things that I want to say about love. Love is all involved in how you treat people. It's not a gooey feeling. It's how you decide to treat people. And I think that love manifests basically in two ways. It gives and it forgives. It gives and it forgives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish from their sins because they can be forgiven <laughs> and be made whole. So the two things that I see God giving us every single day of our lives is forgiveness, and then he just gives and gives. He takes care of us. He meets our needs. 
He gives us mercy. He gives us compassion. And that's really all we need to do. Get up, go out in the world and say, I'm committed to love people today. Devil, go hang yourself. I'm walking in love. I'm going to walk in peace. I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to laugh a lot because I know you want me sad and depressed. Come on, we're in a war. Stop assisting the devil and start resisting the devil. Did you know that one of the most powerful weapons against the devil, and perhaps the most overlooked, is love? That's right, love is spiritual warfare. And once you activate it in every area of your life, the devil really begins to lose his power over you. Today we're offering you some unique teaching. It's three CDs called, Are You Resisting or Assisting the Devil? Now, not one of us would want to assist the devil, so we would certainly hope we're not doing that, but sometimes through a lack of knowledge, we can open doors for the enemy and not even realize that we're doing it. So why not get these three CDs, three hours of teaching, and I believe it's going to really help you to locate some areas in your life that if you just make a little adjustment or a little change, it can make a huge difference in your life. And today we're offering this to you for your gift to the ministry of any amount. That's right. We trust you to do your very best. Those of you that can give more, please do that, and you'll help make up for some of the ones who can't give as much. We want everybody to have this teaching. That's why we're doing this, because we feel very strongly about it, that it's going to be a help to a lot of people. Are you resisting or assisting the devil? Joyce's three CD series will arm you with everything you need to stand against the enemy. The greatest thing in the world is to walk in love. So we have to be very careful of strife. We have to be very careful of unforgiveness. Anytime that you allow unforgiveness to stay in your heart, you're opening a door for the enemy. You're assisting him. Don't be the devil's assistant. This series is available today for your gift of any amount. To order, call us toll free at 1-800-727-9673 or visit us at JoyceMeyer.org. Don't miss your chance to see Joyce live. 